Um, our first speaker is, is Dorothy Khan, who's assistant professor in the division of <coughs> state architecture at Hong Kong University. And uh, she will be speaking for about 20 minutes on the title up here. Uh, I'll say a few words of introduction for our second speaker. I would suggest that we do the two presentations first. If necessary, I will have some comments and discussion to make, but I have a sense there will be some questions and, and discussion from the floor as well. Uh, so Dorothy, over to you. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep within 20 minutes since lunch seems to be a very important time of the day. Um, the research that I'm presenting today is really in collaboration with two other individuals, Max Hirsch, who's also at Hong Kong U. Um, he's with the Hong Kong Institute of Humanities and Social Science, and Margaret Crawford, who's at UC Berkeley. Um, and so, just a little bit of background. Um, Pan Yu is a district of Guangzhou City, um, and so we're going to go from this part of the world to somewhere closer to where um, I live. So Pan Yu is really this sort of dark area over here. It's part of Guangzhou province. Guangzhou city, uh, Guangzhou itself is fairly large. Um, and what's really interesting about Pan Yu is that it has changed a lot. So this is um, a map, and I apologize, it's not very legible. I didn't draw it. Um, uh, of, of the shifting administrative boundaries of Pan Yu from about um, 1920s when it was part of Guangzhou City, then it transitioned out and became its own um, sort of uh, county. Um, and really in, in 19, I'm going to just start from 1975 because I'm going to focus on the, the sort of last 30 years of development in this particular area. Pan Yu was a county in 1975 and in 1992 it became a county level city, it became its own um, municipality in some ways. Um, and, but then in 2000 it was incorporated into Guangzhou as a district of Guangzhou, um, which is up here. Um, then, further on, in 2006, the southern part of the district became independent. It became Nansha District, um, which is about here. And then in 2012, which is extremely recent, this part became part of Nansha District. And so, what I would argue today um, is that these changing administrative boundaries actually have a huge impact on the way that village-based transformations have occurred within this area. So. Um, uh, uh, this is um, uh, by Zhang Zhichang. He's, uh, he's actually the head of urban planning at, um, in Panyu District. And when we interviewed him, he showed us his dissertation, which is where these maps come from. And so his argument, or his research had revealed uh, when he was working on his dissertation that in 1995, when Panyu was a county level city, that approximately there were about 153 villages and about 153 industrial clusters, approximately. And so it, there was a sort of one-to-one -one ratio in terms of where villages were and where industrialization was occurring. Um, in 2000, when it became a district of Guangzhou, um, you can begin to see that the blue, which is the industrial clusters, are, are pretty scattered throughout the district. Um, but then in 2007, what you start seeing is the consolidation of land, whether it's industrial, whether it's residential, or other types of land uses. So his, his argument is essentially that in, in the 90s, when it was still a county level city, it had to do with the kind of land rights that each of these villages had, and the, um, the, the influx of capital obviously, and, and George Lin actually writes a lot about this mm -hmm. in his work, the influx of capital from the diaspora, from Hong Kong and from overseas in Southeast Asia, and how they were attached to their specific villages. Um, in 2000, when it became a district of Guangzhou, land control was much more strict. And so the villages had a lot less autonomy in terms of dealing with land, um, land uses within their own villages. And then further on, um, after that, um, you begin to see more mega projects occurring within Pine View. So um, we're kind of coming at this in a, in a very different way. As a designer, what we tried to do was use different ways of representation to start understanding what is really happening within these, um, these areas. So um, as part of a master's level research seminar, we gave we picked four villages um, within Pine District. 
um, you see Beigang, Mingjing, Longmei Village, and Shani Village. And these villages were, were chosen um, after a bit of research, um, we, we picked Shani because it used to be part of Panyu and then didn't, then was sort of excluded. Um, Longmei Village has um, some really interesting history. Um, Mingjing Village is a sort of typical, um, it, it now is an industrial zone as well as one of the most important um, horticultural industrial areas in this area, and Beigang Village is part of a new mega project that was completed in the late 2000s um, uh, of, of this sort of large um, sort of uh, university town complex. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at these villages really not to, to try to portray sort of an overview of what is happening in Panyu, but sort of looking at these special moments as a way, as a, as a way into understanding the sort of larger um, changes within the region. So Mingjing Village, I'm going to start here. Um, and what you see here in this aerial, um, it's, it's pretty typical, it seems, uh, of a, a Pearl River Delta village. You have the village on this side, you have major infrastructure over here, and on this side, um, you have industrial zones, and then you kind of see these sort of um, uh, agricultural areas on the periphery. It seems very typical, but what we found during interviews with villagers um, and with some of the business owners is that um, the, the argument that I made before, this administrative change, was extremely important. In 1992, when Panyu became an independent county level city, um, and prior to that, what you see from the bottom are donations from overseas. So a lot of the facilities like the hospital, the elementary school, um, the, the sort of sports complex were donated by various individuals that had moved from the village overseas and came back, and so we started tracking some of these donations. But at the same time, you see similar in individuals. So the person who donated the nursing home here also invested in an industrial complex within the village. So you see these overlapping individuals, you see these alliances. Um, and a, a sort of investment within the village that occurred before Panyu became a district of Guangzhou. After that, what you see is much more top-down planning. So Guangzhou decided that they were going to develop the horticulture industry here, and that's what they did. Um, and what's happened since then, and that the students were trying to portray here, is that the form of this landscape began to change and to shift. So what you see here, are the original village houses. And it's very typical in Guangzhou, in the Guangzhou periphery, where original village houses were torn down and then they built these sort of really large, tall buildings. It's not an urban village. I want to distinguish it from what we've seen in Shenzhen or even in, in, um, in Shanghai in terms of what a typical urban village is. And that happened in the 90s, uh, mid 90s, late 90s, in order to house the sort of factory workers that were starting to come in due to this um, investment. Um, but then on the periphery of it, here you start to see these greenhouses and the, um, the flower industry really um, flourishing, sorry for the pun, um, in, in this area. And what we found through our interviews with villagers was that actually the people that were involved in, every, in each of these zones were different. So, in the industrial zones, it was mostly migrant workers that had come um, from Sichuan or, or, or um, Hunan. And then here, the people that were involved with the flower industry were local villagers. And that the two communities, other than the housing situation, didn't really interact economically, which was a surprise to us, because we assumed that there were also migrant workers in this sort of industrialized horticultural business. But because that was reserved for sort of local um, economy um, and economic production, and there was government investment in that in terms of setting up the infrastructure, so that it kind of was preserved for a particular demographic. So that's one type of village that we observed. Shani village is very different. Um, it is uh, following this river. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Shani because um, it, 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 uh, it's, I think it's super interesting. Um, it, it's really relying on sort of a remittance economy. Many of the villagers have gone to Guangzhou or other areas to work, and most of the new development in this area are based on sort of a remittance economy where people are bringing back um, money and building new village houses. Dorothy, um, can I, sorry, yep. just very quickly interrupt. 
is this still, is this now in the urban district? It is part of the Nanshaw district, yes. But so this is a, yeah, okay. So, so just it's, a still reminder part, to, it's still part of the sort of metropolitan or the municipality of Wong But this is a shu chu, right? This, this is a... But it's a village. It's still a twin. Okay, that's, twin. that's what I wanted to clarify. It's still a twin. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's a very typical kind of situation. Um, and what we started um, mapping uh, materially was how the village um, architecture had changed over time. I'm not going to dwell on this, um, but uh, I love this quote from the, the village head, the roads bring wealth, and so they really changed a sort of very canal-based, water-based um, village, and, and they built all these roads along the canals, and apparently that brings money. I don't think it quite worked that way, but that's at least the idea. Um, and there's also still a very nostalgic um, uh, uh, narrative from some of the old ladies that we visited, um, and some of um, uh, some of these different inhabitants that dealt with the, the river specifically. Um, and again, um, sort of an awareness about the environmental degradation due to factories from um, close by. So we go from that very rural context, and then um, I wanted to show. I, I apologize; it's, so, it's not dark enough. Um, so this is University Town. It was completed in about 2007 when Guangzhou City's mayor decided that he was going to move every major university and create a branch on this island. Um, Guangzhou, um, actually, it was very interesting when we were interviewing uh, some of the people that were involved in the project. They set up a new office that dealt with this. They had to come up with a new banking system in order to fast track this particular project. Um, and so they created these sort of rings of zones, and so in the middle it is um, a, a sort of recreational area, you have a park, and then you have the sort of learning area, and then the residential area, so it's this really these concentric circles um, that come out. And what's interesting is that there are four villages left on this island. Beigong is over here, there's um, uh, four, uh, three more over here and over here. Um, and I'm going to focus on Beigang because it's a really interesting example of how sort of large-scale planning, the things that were left out of large-scale planning, actually began to occur in these villages. These villages rose to the occasion and really began to provide for um, aspects that the, pl the planning neglected. Um, and so the, the first thing um, in terms of a collaboration, what was really interesting about Beigong Village was that there was an interaction between different types of people. And this was actually very important for us. It wasn't just the villagers versus someone else. <coughs> there is a much more complex financial arrangement that produced these types of architectures um, that um, we sometimes neglect. And so we, we tried to understand the relationship between the students that were brought in by this large-scale planning project, what the village committee's um, aspirations were, and how they began to manage all of this, investors, and the migrant workers that actually also ended up in this village. And so Gobo Mall is a five-story mall that is built in this urban village right next to, I, I can't remember which university anymore, um, and it has like all of these outlet, it has an Adidas, a, Mike, a McDonald's, but right next to it is sort of sanitized food street um, that it, it's standardized, you can begin to see this sort of row over here, um, it's open late at night, and Beigong has developed a reputation as being the, the sort of food village within university town. So if you want food, this is where you go. Um, in addition to this, you also have the old village fabric converted into restaurants um, and love hotels and um, all sorts of other things. One space that we found very interesting, it, they call it a, it's a, it's a, they call it a co-working space. Um, and the owner of this particular space um, so Chaba, he's actually a graduate of one of the schools within University Island. So he found a space in the village, he converted it into a coffee bar, you get free Wi-Fi there, um, there's these study rooms, um, and what, what he found it, that was missing in the sort of larger planning of University Town was the, the sort of aspects of um, working space and social space for students. And so students would come here, they would work together, they would collaborate, um, because the universities didn't have the facilities, they didn't have the libraries and mm -hmm. the kind of working spaces that were required for this because the project was literally built in like four years. 
from planning to mm -hmm. completion. Um, another thing that we found which was interesting about this particular space was that <coughs> employers from Guangzhou would come here yeah. and recruit We're students. Coming. Because there was, because there's like, I don't know, 19 different campuses on this university island. And so for them to recruit from university to university is very difficult. So instead of that, they find these sort of neutral spaces um, that happen outside of the university campuses to recruit students. And so they also kind of um, uh, get a small fee from that. And so you were beginning to see a, a much more interesting dynamic in terms of how this particular village is, is playing an interesting role. Um, another really cool space that we found was, uh, we call it the, the Ancestor Hall Hotel. So one of the Ancestors Halls, um, you can sort of see it over here, has been converted into a hotel because there are not enough hotel facilities on the island for people, uh, for parents, for example, when they come to graduation. Um, there's some really high-end, like four-star hotels, three-star hotels for conferences, but you know, for my, my father and my mother from, I don't know, Sichuan province or whatever, th this is where they would stay. And so um, we also find out that there were originally, uh, the, the village was actually cut in half when uh, university town was built, and this was the ancestral hall where all the villagers were relocated somewhere else. And so this was the unclaimed ancestral hall um, that remained in the village. The other ancestral hall is still in use. And so this was also an interesting kind of development in terms of um, what was happening here. Now, the interesting thing too is again very typical of Guangzhou villages is that the original villages don't live here anymore. Um, most of these facilities are actually run by migrants. They're not migrant workers that came from factories. They're, they're just sort of a, a new kind of migrant. They're no longer the sort of working class anymore. They come here, they, they, they um, rent these spaces from the original villagers, and they make a business out of it. And they convert these spaces, and so they actually have quite a bit of autonomy within these spaces. Um, in, in fact, um, Oh, I'm in China, I'm not supposed to do this. Um, we have this sort of, this strange, we found a, 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 a piece of vacant land where apparently, and we couldn't interview this person specifically, but apparently one of the migrants is starting to put up all of these signs and is, claim, is trying to claim this vacant land so that he could build something onto it. And so there's also these kind of land disputes that are starting to occur. So what you've seen so far, are villages that specialize in particular industries. You see a typical rural village that it relies on uh, remittance economy. And then you see Beigang Village, which is really um, starting to respond to these sort of mega projects that are starting to occur in the periphery of the city. Um, I'm gonna end on Longmei Village, um, which is very interesting and it kind of defies these categories. So if the other ones, you could sort of categorize it neatly, this well, not quite so neatly, but it's somewhat. Lome Village is kind of difficult, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna explain a little bit why. Um, Lome Village is located on one of the major roads. This is um, Yingbing Da Da, which connects down to Shichao, which is the main uh, main urban center of uh, the Panyu District. Um, this is uh, from 2009, um, and it, it's. In two, the existing conditions in 2009. So what you see here, the yellow are um, residential areas. This is the ancestral pond. The uh, the ancestors' halls are here. Um, this area is industrial. These areas are vacant at the moment. Um, and what you see here, um, which is still within the limits of the village, is a uh, very large um, IT park. Um, you also have a gated community here and a gated community here. So, Lomei Village, um, I'll show you the aerial, you can kind of see it here. Um, Lomei Village is, uh, is really interesting. It's known for making gambling machines. So, um, you know, all the illegal gambling machines that you see in Southeast Asia, they actually also sell them in the Middle East and it's completely illegal. And so they were known for this. There's actually been a number of exposés if you go on um, some of the, the Chinese social media, you'll find exposés on like Lomé Village and the gambling machines that they make, and, and it's, it's quite scandalous. Um, and so what happened was that the government realized this was a problem. 
um, that the village was starting to create this enterprise, um, typical of a, a, a Pearl River Delta village at that time. Um, there were these factories that were built in the 90s. Um, the village abandoned their old village core and built a new village, so most of the original villagers live here, and this is where the migrants live. Um, they continued with this sort of gambling machine industry. Um, and then the, um, in, let me see, what, what year was it? Um, notes. Um, in 2000, the Chinese government began to enforce very strict laws about gambling machines, and so this was deemed illegal. So in 2000, um, they tried to do what they call uh, or like industrial upgrading. And so they, they started planning this new IT park over here, which is about 10, 12 story sort of glazed buildings in giant mega blocks. You can kind of see the, the difference between the fabric over here and the fabric over here. Um, and the idea was that, well, you guys make gambling machines, so you have this expertise in digital stuff, right? So if we upgrade you, um, if we provide you with sort of an IT park, we can begin to change. I mean, it's actually a very interesting idea and, and very site-specific, too. We can upgrade the industry of your village so that you're no longer relying on these illegal gambling machines. Um, this is currently only 30% occupied. Um, since then, but there's still a lot of optimism, and so when we were there last fall, they actually built an extension to the IT park, even though it's 30% vacant. Um, so there's some really interesting dynamics, I think, within that that uh, that begin to um, form this village where you have almost everything. You have the old village core with the, the feng shui um, pond. You have big, um, your factories. You have these mega block very, very urban kind of conditions within the village boundary. You also have gated communities within it. So how do you begin to categorize this kind of development? It's really, really difficult, and it's also really interesting how these different phases of development within Han Yu have really created the opportunity for this to happen. So I'm just going to go through some of the landscapes of this village. Um, you can see here, this is a, a community center and ancestral hall. Um, and it still has a, a pretty vibrant village community, so not all of the villagers have moved to Guangzhou. Um, there's still the village tree. Uh, and so in the 90s, they, sold, they actually allocated new land um, to create this sort of new community. Um, and so it has become this sort of, this new village is really the showroom. Um, for their gambling machines. Um, now it's no more gambling machines, it's mostly game machines. Um, but it, it's, we saw, I don't know, I think we saw um, uh, Arabic text on some of the, um, the signs, and so we assume that there's an international market for this. This is the IT park, and you can begin to see the, the very, very different character. Um, and you can begin to imagine how awkward it is to have this in the middle of a farming community. Um, and then the, the last area, and, and this is actually a really important zone, is that the, the village is banking all this agriculture land in between the old village and the IT park um, for future development. And this is actually really important as part of the village development strategy. Um, right now, the agriculture land um, is rented to migrants for farming. The villagers don't farm it anymore. They make enough profits from rents and stuff like that. Um, and the idea is that they're hoping for continued residential development as well as um, the, the expansion of the IT park. Now, this is kind of difficult in the current policies in China in terms of conserving agricultural land. And so, um, when we were just when we were interviewing the head of planning in Pan Yu, what he discussed was that now it's very difficult to convert agricultural land to other types of uses. Um, because the government is, 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 has a very, very strict control over these land use conversions. And so in, um, in administratively in a place like Longmei, where it's still a, a rural village in some sense, um, this land is extremely valuable, but it's also in limbo because unless the central, and it's at the central level, unless the central government allows Guangzhou to convert more land, this land would be vacant in perpetuity. So there's a, there's a very interesting balance, I think, that they're trying to strike here 
Um, we observe that there's a lot of new development that's happening in Pan Yu in terms of new residential areas being built. And apparently, what's happened is that villages have been pretty smart. Since the, the conversion from um, a county level city to a uh, part of Guangzhou, a lot of the land uses were already converted but banked in the late 90s and are now just getting built um, as real estate values are increasing. And so there, there's a really important moment that kind of anticipated the, the conversion and that, I don't know if it was pure luck or if they actually did anticipate this, but I'd like to know more um, in terms of how they would actually control the, the real estate market within here. So um, this is the end of my presentation. Um, this is really a work in progress. We just started this project about six months ago and we're hoping um, to really look into this a little bit more and reflect on what's happening in the Pearl River Delta, sort of a, an update to what's happened a lot of the scholarship about 10, 15 years ago. And so it would be really great to hear